Well, um, yeah, how, how does uh, the work that I and others have been doing um, tie into uh, COVID-19? Uh, I've just been finishing a book on spiritual struggles called uh, with Julie Eckstein, and the tentative title is uh, Shaken to the Core, Spiritual Struggles in Clinical Research and Practice. And in, in this, putting on in the final touches, uh, COVID-19 hit. And I, I hadn't had a single reference to it. I hadn't had a, a single reference to uh, the life stress of being part of a plague. Um, I thought that uh, plagues were largely a thing of the past, um, but that's obviously not the case. And so the question I've had to think about it fairly quickly as I'm revising the book is, okay, where does uh, a, a, a pandemic, a plague, uh, how does that impact us uh, spiritually, not just psychologically, socially, and physically? And what do does spiritually have to say for the ways we may come to terms with it? So, so just some thoughts, and this won't take long. If you'd like to have a little discussion about this after, I'd be very interested because my, my thinking on this is about, uh, is emerging about as quickly as uh, the, corona, the coronavirus. Um, and I think that uh, the, as I said, the, the, I had thought that plagues were a thing of the past and then the tsunami of COVID-19 uh, began to break on our shores and it continues to break. Um, that's my image of huge tsunami on both coasts breaking and working its way towards the, the middle of the United States. And so now we have our own modern day plague. Um, I think it is a, uh, a global disaster, really. I don't think we should minimize it. It's a threat to our physical health, um, our web of relationships, our economic well-being, uh, really our hopes and dreams and, and the things that we hold most sacred in our lives. Um, I think rightly so, our focus has been um, the, the, the basic stress response, which is fight or flight, where we're fighting the disease. And um, I'm, I'm heartened by the work of so many um, scientists and researchers all over the world who are moving beyond their borders to share data, share the genome, share all kinds of interesting possibilities for cure and a vaccine. And flight, uh, frankly, we need to flee <laughs> infection. And we're all, I mean, that's why we're, we're talking on, on the, uh, through the modern marvels of technology here apart from each other. But I think there has to be something more than fight or flight. And I'd, I'd think about it in terms of, um, at the very minimum, staying afloat uh, and, and, and even the possibility of flourishing and, and to do that, I think we need to be drawing on our emotional, our social, and our spiritual resources. Uh, I, I think of these as these are really resources of the human spirit, and it seems to me they're going to make uh, they're going to be as essential to our survival as any um, vaccine or any cure that we develop. Um, I think of, and I've been thinking of ISH in this time, and I think of uh, the Institute as one of the critical places to foster um, efforts to sustain the lives of people on the front line in particular by helping them tap into their, their deepest resources. Um, and I think we have to be, and I know you are, because I've seen some of the things you're doing, have to be creative about doing that because the, we typically offer our help through social connections and yet the coronavirus has uh, disrupted uh, our social connections, the, basically the channels through which we do help people. So we have to come up with all kinds of things and it's disrupted the get-togethers that are so important for people and some of the r religious and social resources just attending religious congregations have been disrupted. So I think 
we need to be focusing a lot on the kind of the inner resources that we can find. And I know through uh, a lot of the activities you're doing there, uh, I think about Lex's work on yoga and meditation, prayer, you know, things that can sustain people even by themselves. So we need to be creative. Um, but I do want to stress that we're being shaken not only um, psychologically and emotionally and physically, but spiritually. And for many people, I suspect it's triggering or is about to trigger um, powerful spiritual struggles, uh, shaken faith, questions of meaning, um, feelings of anger, abandonment, uh, um, punishment in relation to God, uh, and moral struggles. Um, I've been struck by stories I've been reading about uh, healthcare professionals in the in the thick of it on the front lines who are having to make these terrible triage decisions about who gets a ventilator. And they talk about their terrible conflict, their inner conflict and guilt about tr trying to play God, being in that position of having to make these life and death decisions. Um, so the response to these struggles, w w I think will be critical. That's what we found in our research that struggles can be potentially um, uh, a uh, source of terrible brokenness and decline, but they can also be a source of growth and positive transformation. And the, the key question is, so how do you come to terms with these fundamental existential spiritual struggles? Spirituality can be a help or a hindrance. I've been so disheartened by these stories of um, religious leaders all over the world across religious traditions who insist on people coming together to be in religious communities for services in spite of the dangers and how lives are being put in, in risk and even destroyed. Um, I've been struck by people who their religious coping method is deferral. So they say, I read one minister saying, well, I don't need to take care of myself. I don't need to sanitize my hands. God is my sanitizer. <laughs> You know, so in, in this case, you know, we find our, our spiritual and religious side making matters worse. Um, but I don't think it has to be that way. And I know it's not the case because there are also wonderful resources that we can and should be drawing on. Um, and that's part of what you're doing. I ha One more thought, and then I can kind of just, I'd be interested in your thoughts on all of these um, just <laughs> initial reflections. That it strikes me that the this the pandemic and the struggles that it's generating now, the fear it's generating, the grief it's producing and will likely continue to produce of all these people whose lives have been uprooted and lives destroyed. I think this is going to continue to sweep over people for years to come, well after the virus itself has receded. Um, I was, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say, I think this plague is going to be the defining event, uh, for the rest of our lives, at least those of us who are you know, on the older side of things, certainly my life. So it's important to, uh, really anticipate a post COVID-19 wave of impacts. Uh, I suspect, uh, a sharp rise in PTSD, um, suicidality, addiction, um, domestic conflict. I think about these dysfunctional marriages and families where people are forced to hunker down together and they, they don't like each other. They don't have skills for mastering this. And it's like putting uh, people without those skills together in a cage and they're gonna to start to fight. I'm really worried about that, um, the likelihood of abuse that's going to be coming up now. And, and of course, spiritual distress. So again, I think uh, ISH has, uh, has and is playing a vital role here. Um, but I'm, I'm suggesting, you know, think forward in that we should be anticipating uh, some powerful aftershocks and helping people access resources to help them anticipate the aftershocks so they can uh, stay afloat um, and they can even flourish. 
Um, the most hopeful image I have, and I know some I've shared this with some of you, comes from the, uh, uh, the Kintsugi, which is based on a Japanese philosophy. And it's, it's a Japanese art form. And what it consists of is, uh, uh, the best examples I've seen are in ceramics art. And the uh, ceramic piece is shattered. And then it's put back together again with gold or um, silver filigree. And the, 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 a new wholeness is created out of brokenness. Mm. And, and the new wholeness is not just uh, the same old piece, it's a transformed piece. And the piece has been transformed as a work of art. Wow. I think about that in terms of uh, psychotherapy, that we work with clients and patients who come to us feeling broken. And part of what we do is to try to help them put their lives back together again. And I've used that metaphor with many of my clients who like it a lot. It's a very hopeful metaphor. One, one client wrote me afterwards, said she now, she thinks of me as Ken Zugi. <laughs> that's, that's one of the nicest compliments I've gotten. So let, let me just uh, say, I am so grateful that all of you are out there doing the work that you're doing, because I know it's, it's making a difference to the people on the front lines. And I think it's going to continue to be important and maybe be even more important as we hit this uh, second wave of uh, psychological, emotional, and spiritual problems that people will be suffering as a result of this major trauma.